Welcome. Merry Christmas this Christmas season. Uh, thank you again for uh, tuning in to the Word of God ministry uh, that comes to you from St. John's Lutheran Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, I want to remind folks that um, we are having Christmas Eve services this coming uh, Friday night at uh, 5 o'clock, or excuse me, at 5.30 and 8 o'clock. That's 5.30 uh, and 8 o'clock. Please join us. <clears throat> uh, this morning, um, we are considering the song that Mary, the mother of Jesus, sang when she visited her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth recognized that Mary was carrying the Savior. So let's begin our time together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament. It's Micah 5, verses 1 through 5. And this is the prophecy that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Gather your troops, O city of troops, for siege is laid against us, and they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are least among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old and from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor and gives birth, and he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Of course, that's the prediction that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, now, um, you know, that prediction was given seven, several hundred years, 700 years about before um, Christ was uh, born. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, at the time that Christ was born, Bethlehem was a very, very small uh, village. Uh, and, you know, so it's always interested me that, that uh, Christ did not come and he was not born in Jerusalem or Rome or any of the great cities of that time where his birth probably would have been at least, um, could have been spread to, to more people more quickly, like through the shepherds and so forth. Um, but God does work often through the humble things, through the things that are not great in the eyes of the Lord. And so people have been singing about this little town Bethlehem for over 2,000 years because that's where the Savior of the world was born. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our gospel lesson, which is the sermon text for today, comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. Now Mary arose in those days, and she went out into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. That's John the Baptist who was yet to be born. She continues, so blessed is she, she's talking about Mary, blessed is she who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told to her from the Lord when the angel spoke to Mary. 
And so Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. And behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. And then Mary remained with Elizabeth for three months and then returned to her own house. The pregnant Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. When they met, Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, exclaims with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Both Elizabeth and the unborn child in her womb recognize that Mary bears the long-awaited Savior. Mary had believed the words of the angel Gabriel. You know the song we hear often this time of year, Mary, did you know? Well, Mary did know. She did know that she was carrying the long-awaited Messiah. However, for months, nothing special about her pregnancy seemed to happen, and I wonder if she began to wonder. But then when she meets Elizabeth, Elizabeth, by the Spirit, affirms the good news that Mary is carrying the Messiah. And then Mary responds to this good news with a song that the church will keep singing until Christ returns. The song is known as the Magnificat. For centuries, a version of the Magnificat was found in the sung liturgies of the Christian church. Luther used Mary's song of thanksgiving here as a thank you note to the German prince, John Frederick, who later became known as John the Magnanimous because of his great support for Luther. Luther, being a good German, it took Luther 20 months and the equivalent of 33 pages of single-spaced typing (laughs) to finish his thank you note. I promise I will not have as much to say this morning. Let's pray. Father, the message of Mary contains the good news of a savior. Uh, just just filled, Lord, with, with her rejoicing that you have come and had mercy, mercy upon your people. So bless our hearts today, Lord, for we know we are sinners and we are in great need of grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. How do we feel about Mary in the the Protestant church? Well, we give Mary great honor. We call her blessed. Um, We we do lift lift her up as the mother of our Savior Jesus Christ, but we do not worship her. We do not pray to her. Um, And everything that, that Mary did that was God blessing uh, Mary. And so uh, we, do, we do respect and honor her, but we do not worship her. Moving on, uh, Mary's song, I said, is called The Magnificent, based on the opening line where Mary says, my soul will magnify the Lord. And so Mary sings a hymn to lift up and magnify the wonder of God. The focus is on the God who has blessed Mary and the God who blesses us in Jesus. But you wouldn't get that if you reviewed Roman Catholic or even Protestant Christian preaching on this verse and this passage. I searched the topic, sermon titles, for 
the Magnificat, and you could hardly tell if any one of them focused on God. These were the titles, Mary's Humility, Mary's Unselfishness, Mary Our Model, The Power of a True Christian Woman, Joyous Workers Do Most for God. <laughs> Seriously, the Magnificat has turned into a law telling us that we should work for the Lord with joy. My goodness. The reverence due the Virgin Mary, the virtues of Mary, true womanly fame, Christianity and women, the Virgin's character. Other Christians, writers mostly, have called Mary's song revolutionary. The famous preacher E. Stanley Jones called the Magnificat the most revolutionary document in the history of the world. Barclay, a very renowned Christian commentator writes, it is a revolutionary bombshell. He goes on to say that this song lays out three revolutions, an economic revolution, a political revolution, and a moral revolution. Another writer says that the Magnificat so terrified the czars and the rich of Russia that they refused to let it be read in the Russian churches. Geldenhaus says that the Magnificat announces to the world powerful revolutionary principles. It sometimes amazes me how often preachers use the, the holy text, this precious scripture from God where God himself is speaking to us as a, as a pretext to go off on a tangent on things that that verse were never meant to address originally or even today. <clears throat> That's why it's so important that we also always ask ourselves, what is this passage saying to those who heard it? And then we apply it to ourselves. What is it saying to us today? So it's no wonder to me that our pews and our living rooms are filled with people today who think that the Bible is mainly all about self-improvement or social change or how we should live. The gospel is not about who we are, but who God is. The gospel is not what we should do, but what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. And that's what Mary is rejoicing in, in this hymn. So if we are not to use Mary's song as an opportunity to focus on Mary's character or some kind of revolution, what's Mary's song really all about? Well, how does she start? She magnifies God first of all, primarily, before anything else. She magnifies God for who God is, her Lord. And if the intro is about God, Maybe that's the lens for the rest of the hymn as well. As so many of our hymns, the first verse kind of sets the stage for everything that comes after it. In verse 46, Mary acknowledges that God is the Lord, the one who rules and has authority over all things. And then in verse 47, she rejoices that God is her Savior. Brothers and sisters, only sinners need a Savior. Mary was not sinless. She had both original sin and she was a sinner. And so Mary understands that she's not some pure, righteous, extra special believer. She rejoices that God is her savior. And she doesn't sing that God is the savior, although we often do that. She sings because God is her savior. She's a sinner in need of saving. And in the coming of Jesus, she has one. Brothers and sisters, if you have nothing else to sing about in life, sing that the Lord of creation has saved you from sin and death, has blessed you personally with the gift of salvation. Mary magnifies God because God is her Savior. Months before she burst into this 
song of praise. The angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she would conceive miraculously by the Holy Spirit and give birth. But the angel didn't stop there. The angel said, Mary, Mary, when he is born, you are to name the child Jesus because, because he will save his people from their sins. Save them not from slavery, not from poverty, not from the Romans, not from hunger, but from their sins. This opening verse points to the fact that God was coming into the world. God was entering into the world through Mary's womb to come and save us from our sins. Mary knew she was a sinner in need of forgiveness. How did she know? Because two verses later, Mary sings, God is mighty and God is holy. So the next verse, she sings of God's mercy to all people, all people who fear or believe in God throughout every generation, because God's mercy is to be found in Mary's child. Mercy not only for Mary, Mercy for anyone who recognizes that God is the Holy One and humble themselves in repentance before God, just as Mary did. It says he scatters the proud, those who think they don't need God. Mercy is for those like you and me who know we have no chance to stand before a holy God and no chance to enter into his presence because he is all-powerful and the holy one who judges sin and we're sinners. Others are proud in the imagination of their own hearts. I love that phrase there. They are proud in the imagination of their own hearts, imagining that they are already good enough for God. Others sit on their personal throne and they will be pulled down. It is in Mary's child Jesus that people impoverished by sin are made rich through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. People who hunger for God are fed. They're fed the good news that God has lifted them up in Jesus Christ. And finally, as in most of our hymns, the last verses repeat the theme of the first verse. God has helped his people by his mercy. The same mercy that God spoke about from Abraham until Christmas, that a savior, a seed of Abraham, Mary's seed, would save us from our sins. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, this Christmas season for the precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. It, it is beyond our understanding, Lord, that he who sits next to you on the throne of glory would cast aside his crown and robe and enter into the womb of a peasant woman and to remain there for, for nine months until that wondrous evening that we call Christmas. Yes, Mary knew. Mary knew that the child she carried was the one who would save the world from its sins. That's what makes Christmas so special. We thank you, Lord, we thank you for this gift that is so precious we cannot value it and so wondrous we can't even begin to comprehend it. But all of it was done for us so that we can have peace and joy in our hearts while we live in this life through your gift of faith and that we can have peace and joy forever for when this baby grows up, this baby says, right before he went to his death and resurrection, this baby says, I am going to prepare a place for you, that where you are, where I am, you may be also. 
Lord, we will never understand Christmas, and the only thing we can do is believe it and rejoice in it and help us to do that. Amen. Please pray with me at home. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, please, uh, if you are able, join us Christmas Eve at 5.30 or 8 o'clock. Um, we would uh, love to have you come and make worshiping Christ on Christmas Eve part of, with us, part of your Christmas celebration this year. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you and his loved ones peace. Not just peace during Christmas, but peace forever. Amen.